Welcome to my channel. This is today's episode of Daily News Clips. But before I get to that, I have to thank you for coming to my channel. Thank you for watching my videos. Thank you for the tremendous growth of my channel. And thank you for your kind words about me. I really do appreciate it. I'm so thankful for every one of you that comes to watch my videos. Today, I have several items. I'm going to get to that one on the screen in a minute, but first I want to cover a couple other things. Uh, I have an R a, a uh, interview with um, a gentleman on Tucker Carlson for the FBI's attack on free speech. And I'm just going to show you a little bit of this, and then we're going to move on to other things. Now, this gentleman lives in Florida, and uh, he's, I guess you could call him controversial, but uh, what's happened to him is, is disturbing. So it was about two years ago, a little over two years ago, that Russian troops moved into eastern Ukraine, and throughout the West, Western media reported this as a totally unprovoked act of aggression. Who could have seen it coming? But there was, if you paid very close attention, one political group in the United States that had a different explanation for it. And it was a group a lot of people would dismiss as fringe, a group called the African People's Socialist Party. And to be honest, we'd never heard of them. But around this time, they started releasing videos with a different view. Those videos were critical of the United States and NATO. And they pointed out that there was, in fact, a history here and that NATO had been expanding eastward for quite some time and putting a lot of pressure on Russia. Now, you may agree or disagree with that, but they had a, a coherent view of it. And to give you an example of what that view was, here's video from the group's chairman, a man called Omali Yashtela. Watch. There's a discussion about Russian military border uh, buildup uh, on its border uh, with Ukraine and how this represents a terrible threat uh, uh, to Ukraine by uh, by Russians, uh, but there is no acknowledgement of the history uh, that took us to this place, how the U.S. overthrew, uh, uh, participated in <clears throat> facilitating the overthrow of a government in Ukraine that was friendly to the Soviet Union, nor does it talk about the history of this relationship between Ukraine and, and Russia. And you have to remember that they're using NATO here too, and NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, was something that came into existence to deal with the Soviet Union or Soviet Russia, as it used to be called. And so this is an ongoing aggression. It did not just start. It's, all, it's been going on for a while, but the U.S. government uh, uh, relies on the ignorance of, uh, of the people uh, in this country and much of the world that's facilitated by people like Zuckerberg. So you can agree or disagree with that analysis, a couple parts of it are indisputably true. One, the U.S. government does rely on the ignorance of its population to do things in that population's name that the population doesn't want. Start all kinds of pointless wars, for example, get people killed, bankrupt the government. That's all real. It's also true that there is a history in Ukraine, and you may or may not think it justifies Russian aggression, but there's no question that NATO has been moving eastward, and it's hard to see why, what benefit there is to the NATO member states. In any case, that's a point of view, agree with it or not. But for some reason, the FBI was watching. They were watching and they considered sentiments like that, not just wrong or offensive, but a crime. And so three months later, the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, our federal law enforcement tasked with keeping us safe, spent its time and a lot of agents, it looked to be dozens of agents, raiding the home and the office of the man you just saw speaking, as well as the homes of six other members of his organization. Dozens of heavily armed agents descended with automatic weapons. They used flashbang grenades and drones. The first thing they did when they broke in, when they smashed the door, was to tape over the internal security cameras so there would be no record of what they were doing. And then they walked off with a huge amount of material. They stole things from Yeshtela and his wife and a bunch of other people who work for this organization. Now, I'm going to 
put the link in the description and you're welcome to watch the rest of that if you like. But, and, and I'll grant you that his views are controversial. They're certainly not in the uh, mainstream of thought on what's going on in Ukraine. But this is America. We're supposed to be able to say whatever we think, regardless of how controversial it is, regardless of how much people disagree with us, without getting arrested and not charged with a crime. This man was arrested, and for nine months he was not charged with a crime. And now the crimes they're charging him with are basically what you can only describe as free speech violations. This is not America. This is not constitutional. This is not right. I don't care what this man's views are. His views have a right to be aired in the public marketplace. And people can reject them or accept them, whatever they want to do with them. But the government has no business trying to shut him up simply because he disagrees. And if you disagree with that, then I don't know what to tell you. But... You know, there may be countries where free speech is not allowed, but it's supposed to be allowed in America. The next article I have is titled America's Intellectual Bloodbath. And it's a uh, discussion of the recent remarks by Trump that have been taken completely out of context by the media and the left and blown up into some huge thing that you know, they're, what they're saying basically is that uh, Trump has said if he isn't reelected, there's going to be a bloodbath. And that's not what he said at all. What he said was that if he is not elected, there's going to be an economic bloodbath because of all the stupid decisions that the government is currently making. And his big uh, launching pad for this speech was two new car plants being built in Mexico by China so that they can get around the tariffs. And Trump says in his speech that uh, he's going to put, if he's elected, he's going to put a 100% tariff on China, Chinese cars coming out of Mexico, which may, basically means that they're not going to be able to sell them, which is the point. Okay. But... The, the mainstream media and the left has just completely blown this out of proportion and completely out of context and, and just made it ridiculous. I mean, it, it, it's, an, it's an absolute joke what they're doing. And everybody sees it. That's the thing that's, that's, that's so confusing to me is everybody sees it. So why would they keep doing it why would they keep doing it when it's obvious it's a lie and it's obvious to everyone that it it's a complete distortion of fact. I just don't, I don't understand their thinking. I really don't. And you're going to see that in a couple other things I bring up. Uh, the next article I have is, and of course, again, I'll put all these links in the description. Congress asks Capitol Police Chief questions arising from Blaze Media Report. I mentioned to you the other day that uh, there had been some information uncovered about people in the Capitol Police who were being promoted despite having serious offenses on their, on their disciplinary uh, record. And the, the uh, Capitol, the Congress Congressional Committee has gotten a hold of this information and now they're asking the Capitol Police Chief some pointed questions. It'd be interesting to see if anything comes of that. Basically, my view on congressional hearings is they're just basically, um, it's a political sideshow. Nothing ever gets done about it. They expose stuff. The media doesn't care. The people don't care. And life goes on as if nothing changed. But the politicians get to pound their chests like gorillas. The next article I have is The Narcissism and Psychopathy of Seizing Trump's Assets. Now this one I want to I want to show you and I want to talk about a little bit because 
there's an angle to this story that I think is not being discussed. As you're probably aware, Trump was found guilty of fraud in a New York trial by the Attorney General of New York, Letitia James, and this despite the fact that uh, there were no victims, there were no fraud victims. In fact, the banks that he supposedly defrauded said they were happy doing business with him and they didn't feel like they were defrauded at all. But it didn't matter. He got convicted and now he has to pay a huge fine, almost a half a billion dollars. And if he doesn't, they're now threatening to seize his assets. Um, the political aspects of that don't interest me as much as this, though. And I highlighted this section. Uh, Dennis O'Leary, who you may know as Mr. Wonderful on uh, Shark Tank, has been pounding the drums on this ever since the decision was made. Seizing Trump's cash and properties could have significant repercussions, warned business leaders. Quote, I don't think this case is about Trump anymore, said investor Kevin O'Leary on CNN. I think this case is about New York. It's about the American brand. It's about what we promised the world in terms of fairness and justice and investing capital in the country that's built the largest economy on earth. Forfeiture? Seizing of assets? Is that in our nomenclature in America? Is that what we tell people who want to bring their money here and protect, and protect property rights? Forget about Trump. Nothing to do with Trump. You think this is good for business in New York? You think this is good for business in America? O'Leary has actually said he's currently, uh, one of his uh, many adventures is investing in um, what he calls digital properties. They're You've probably seen them popping up all over the place. They're buildings that house lots and lots of servers because that's what the world runs on now is servers. And um, so these places have to have a, a building that's temperature controlled and has backup power systems and all this kind of stuff to keep everything running. And, and they cost a lot of money. I, I can't remember exactly, but I think he said like $4 billion. That's a ridiculous amount of money. But he said, do you think I'm going to build one in New York now? There's no way I would build one in New York. Because every single investor tries to shine the, the brightest and most positive light that they can on the value of their properties. And the banks do their due diligence and say, no, we don't think it's worth that much. It's worth this much. And they negotiate back and forth until they can come to an agreement on a uh, loan amount for, for new construction. And this law that they've now uh, used against Trump could be used against anybody who invests in New York. And Kevin O'Leary said, that's it. I'm not investing in New York anymore. And he says he's not alone. And the bond is unprecedented and punitive. There's no such thing as half a billion bonds, said O'Leary, who is famous for his role on the TV investment reality show Shark Tank. Never been done before. Never. This has never been applied. This law has never been applied. I want you to remember, this is O'Leary again. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is not O'Leary. I want you to remember this moment and don't forget it, said anti-Trump pollster and consultant Frank Luntz on CNN. If the New York Attorney General starts to take his homes away, starts to seize his assets, it's all going to be on camera. You're going to create the greatest victimhood of 2024, and you're going to elect Donald Trump. That's the thing about it that, that just blows my mind, is that they cannot see. These people who are so eager for the blood of Trump cannot see that what they're doing is they're pushing him into the arms of the voters. Look where he is now. He's the presumptive nominee for the Republican Party. Why do you think that happened? It was his mugshot. It was all the attacks that have been made against him. And now, when we're on the cusp of the, uh, I guess you call it electoral season, when they start stumping, they go around making speeches and trying to get people to vote for them in, in November, 
They're going to take his money away. They're going to make it impossible for him to campaign. If you don't think that's transparent, if you don't think that's an obvious <laughs> political ploy, then you're just not thinking squarely. So, but the, the bigger picture for me, not the politics, the bigger picture for me is this is going to, this is going to destroy the economy in New York state. It is because investors are going to say, I, I'm not going to take a chance on that. What if I go up there and they, they apply this law against me and Kevin O'Leary is making that very clear. He's gone on several shows to talk about it. So. The last thing that I have on today's agenda is a uh, video on Prager called Does God Exist? A new Four New Arguments. And I thought this was interesting enough that you could watch the whole thing. You know, for 27 years, I was an atheist. I thought anyone who believed in a God or gods was, well, stupid or uneducated, naive, gullible, or just into the gig for money, sex, and power. I mean, after all, everyone knows that Religion is just a psychological crutch for intellectual weaklings, right? So, what changed my mind? Well, look, I tell the whole story in my book, Shattered, but for our purposes here on Prager University, I was simply challenged by my Christian teammates on the Cincinnati Reds to read some religious books, critique them, and then share with the guys where the authors were wrong and why atheism is the only real and true outlook for anyone not deceived by fantasy, fiction, or mythology. I mean, for someone who wants to base their beliefs and values upon evidence and argument, not emotion and tradition. Now look, simply put, I set out to disprove theism, which I didn't think would take very long. But I ran into some difficulties along the way. <laughs> difficulties like Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas. I mean, in simple terms, I was confronted with the awareness that there are really four big bangs that have to be accounted for, not just one. I had never really even considered that before. I mean, we're all familiar with the first big bang, right? It's usually the answer given to the question, why is there something rather than nothing? It's the idea that there was nothing, it popped and boom, there's something. I mean, that time, matter and space all came into existence and in some great cosmological flash about 16 billion years ago. There was no gradual development, no transitional forms, just a binary flip, a metaphysical, now you don't see it and now you do. Fine, I wanna follow the evidence wherever it leads. However, astrophysicists tell us that this first Big Bang yielded only a handful of fundamental elements and that it would take billions and billions of years for the nuclear furnaces of trillions of stars to yield the 118 elements in the periodic table. But the first theoretical cosmological Big Bang, well, it only yields matter and energy. It doesn't even begin to address the origin of life. So how do you get life from non-life? How did abiogenesis occur? I mean, the notion that something can come from nothing. Where's the evidence? Well, you're gonna need another something from nothing leap of faith, some kind of biological second Big Bang. For all the mind-blowing advancements we've made in physics, biology, and chemistry in just the past hundred years, we're still no closer to making it happen. We don't have a clue. The closer we look, the wider the chasm. I mean, sure, we've learned a lot about how to manipulate life forms, how to add and subtract DNA material, even map the human genome, but we have no idea how to literally create life from dead stuff. Now look, at this point, we still only have physics, chemistry, and some basic biology, or matter, energy, and simple life, if you will. But we still don't have a way to account for the great diversity of life forms. I mean, the huge differences between bacteria, plants, and animals. Nor do we have a way to account for the differences between man and animal. We still don't have an anthropology at this point. So we're going to need a kind of anthropological third Big Bang to account for all this which of course is what Darwin was after in his Descent of Man thesis. Now look, Darwin answered a lot of questions, but he could never answer the core question. How did evolution begin? But hey, we're still not done describing the world that is all around us. A final Big Bang is gonna be required to explain how a mechanistic animal brain 
can become a self-reflective human mind. Even the lowest life forms have brains and central nervous systems. I mean, how does something like that become the mind of a Michelangelo, a Shakespeare, a Beethoven? Come on, animals don't do art and they don't appreciate beauty. But the problem is even more basic than that. How do you account for free will and introspection, let alone man's pressing existential drive to ask why? Well, we're going to need some kind of psychological fourth Big Bang to account for man's moral and aesthetic sense, I mean, his, his search for meaning, significance, and purpose, and of course, his appreciation for the true, the good, and the beautiful. And again, you must understand these problems require bangs. I mean, sudden binary pops into existence, since there's no evidence for any gradual development in any of these. So I, like you, have a choice. It's either faith in these four big bangs of somethings from nothings to account for what we see all around us, or faith in some kind of creator God behind it all. So, next time someone asks you, hey, what about the big bang? Make sure you ask them which one? The cosmological, biological, anthropological, or psychological? I'm Frank Pastore for Prager University. Hmm. I just thought that was <clears throat> a really interesting exposition. And uh, I've always found it rather offensive when people say that uh, only the simple-minded believe in God because I'm not simple-minded. I am an intelligent human being and I have thought this through carefully and studied it carefully. And I've come to the conclusion that God does exist. So, something to think about, the four big bangs. That's news clips for today. Thank you for coming to my channel, and I pray for you every day. I pray that you will live an abundant life, that you'll be healthy, that you'll live a long time, and that God will keep you safe from harm. I pray that the same will happen to every person you love. And I pray most of all that you will be anxious for nothing. But in all things, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, you will make your requests known to God. And the peace that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. This is the Vietnam Mirror Vet, out.